He is preserving for the Southwest a heritage and an heirloom far more golden and entrancingly beautiful than any of her other legacies. It is by the very simplicity and preciseness of his style that he obtains the mellowness, charm, vividness, and gusto that is so patently present in every paragraph he has written. How'd you like to get reviews like that? <laughs> Dobie also collected and told stories about Longhorns, the Mustangs. He's regarded today as uh, one of the key people, if not the key person, who saved the Longhorn from extinction. Uh, you know, when we were industrializing, people didn't really have a need for those open range cows anymore. And so uh, the Longhorn was becoming so scarce, one was offered to the San Antonio Zoo as a curiosity item in the 1920s. And Dobie really uh, did more than anybody to help rescue that breed. And his reputation really just kind of grew over the next 20 years or so. He's, you know, cover of the Atlantic. There he is in Harper's. Uh, he had over 800 magazine articles, 1,300 newspaper columns, in addition to his many books. <laughs> but it wasn't, <laughs> yeah, if you can read this title, it says, J. Frank Dobie, Not at All a Normal Man. Another one of those pamphlets I was telling you about. And what this gets at is it wasn't Dobie's writing that made him so famous. Here's his wife, Bertha, in 1910 at Southwestern University in Georgetown, and then with her husband on the right. And um, here's what she said about Dobie. I love this quote where she kind of sums up his personality. I should say that in Frank, pig, charging bull, and mule together make a half. And the other half is humanity at its very finest. <laughs> so, I think I describe Bertha as Dobie's long-suffering wife at, at one point because they actually had quite an interesting relationship where they worked together so well in so many ways, but there were the times where he just left her alone while he set off on adventures. And she realized, I think at some point, that he cared more for adventure than he did for anything else. Here's Dobie's Guide to Life and Literature of the Southwest, which remains an essential volume for any Southwestern bookshelf. Um, and what I want to show you about this is the copyright page. <laughs> not copyright in 1942. <laughs> Again, not copyright in 1952. Anybody is welcome to help himself to any of it in any way. This gives you an idea of what kind of person Dobie was. No fences, no boundaries, the spirit of freedom. Uh, much of Dobie's philosophy could be summed up in the title to this article, Texas Needs Brains. He was not a particular fan of uh, many things, education, courses, um, uh, certainly public prayer, uh, football for that matter. And he sort of combined his twin dislikes of public prayer and football into one statement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Here's what he said about football coaches who lead their teams in prayer before games. Who believes that God cares whether one bunch of young apes or another has the most success with an inflated pig bladder? So... Dobie was a staunch political conservative, really, for the first two-thirds of his life. But even then, um, he was really, he just took people by surprise all the time. And one of the things he did is he single-handedly integrated the Texas Folklore Society in the 1920s. He brought in Jovita Gonzalez, who was a graduate student at UT Austin. And by 1930, she was president of the Texas Folklore Society, which, you know, is just unprecedented for a woman, Mexican-American, who had not yet turned 30 to be in charge of that organization. And I don't know, do many of you know who Jovita Gonzalez is? Have you heard her story? She's somebody who, Dobie, well, Frank and Bertha both sponsored her as much as they could and uh, helped her get a Rockefeller scholarship to write a novel. And she was really poised to become a major force in Texas letters in the 1930s. And then, um, well, she got married. <laughs> and after she got married, nobody heard a word from her again. And um, in the years since her death, she's kind of been rediscovered, and there have been four posthumous books now published of her work, including that novel that she wrote in the 1930s. And she's seen now as this groundbreaking figure in Chicano literature. And then there's J. Mason Brewer on the right, who uh, Dobie worked with on collecting African-American folk tales. And uh, with J. Mason Brewer, Dobie got his work into the Texas Folklore Society publication uh, as soon as he could after they met. And then in 1934, integrated the Folklore Society again with J. Mason Brewer, who went on to have a terrific career. 
And here's the voice of the coyote, published in 1949. And we kind of have a romantic view of coyotes now. I think a lot of us urban people do. Um, but they're widely considered vermin, uh, particularly among rural people in the American West at that time. And there were widespread extermination campaigns underway, uh, probably not unlike today. By the time Dolly published this book, he was a liberal. And he saw the coyotes as liberal, too. <laughs> he praised them for their individuality, their ability to adapt to change. And he contrasted them against the hysterical hatred of Franklin Roosevelt that so many people had. And he pointed out that the coyotes demonstrate altruistic behavior. They're not simply the fang and claw stereotypes that Dobie wrote, quote, have been overemphasized by a society devoted to propagating the philosophy of greed under the guise of free enterprise. And he suggested decades really before the term ecotourism entered the language that uh, preserving the coyote's home range would provide many more economic benefits than trying to kill them. And people were beginning to notice a common theme through all of Dobie's books you saw, or all of his animal books. You saw the Longhorns and the Mustangs earlier. And Mark, Mark Busby's laughing because he knows what I'm gonna read here. Um, one observer, Mark, Martin Shockley, uh, Notice this common thread. And so here's how he introduced Dobie at a meeting of the Texas Institute of Letters. I came to Texas with about average ignorance and prejudice. I had always considered the coyote a pesky varmint, a cunning chicken thief, a sneaky villain, best seen over the side of a 3030. Then I read a book by Jake Frank Dobie and learned that the coyote is a noble creature with a proud and independent spirit and a fierce love of freedom. I had always considered the longhorn a stupid cow critter, all bone, gristle, and stringy meat, mean, vicious, and hard to handle. Then I read a book by J. Frank Dobie and learned that the longhorn is a noble creature with a proud and independent spirit and a fierce love of freedom. <laughs> I had always considered the mustang the sorriest specimen of horse flesh, hammer-headed, wall-eyed, you-necked, sway-backed, bushy-tailed, ornery, and dangerous. Then I read a book by J. Frank Dobie and learned that the mustang is a noble creature with a proud and independent spirit and a fierce love of freedom. Now they tell me Mr. Dobie is writing about rattlesnakes. <laughs> and I anticipate an agonizing reappraisal. <laughs> and any of you who come in late, we're still talking about how J. Frank Dobie was not at all a normal person. Um, one of the reasons he became famous, frankly, is his uncanny knack for generating publicity. I don't know anyone else who could get a banner headline for refusing to pay a parking ticket. <laughs> there it is. And there's Dobie with his friend Roy Betacek at Barton Springs. Betacek, or Betty, as his friends called him, was not a normal man either. He's a guy who rode his bike across Texas in 1908. And to many of his friends, he seemed to live out of time, having little regard for contemporary mores. Well-versed in classical literature, Betacek was known to wake up before sunrise because he wanted to read an hour or so from the works of Plato or Cicero before going out to get his morning newspaper. Only after reading one of the philosophers, he would proclaim, did he have the perspective to deal with the day's news. <laughs> Betacek was mostly a vegetarian, refused to use pesticides in his garden, and he ate meat only when it was cooked over an open fire. Uh, he thought that would leach out its protein poison. He also lectured friends on the pitfalls of pit toilets and indoor plumbing. He preferred to go out of doors because he said that nature designed us to squat. And so he felt like he functioned best when he squatted as nature decreed. <laughs> Betacek had a first-class mind. He was observant and witty and philosophical. And he, more than anybody, had a huge influence on Dobie's eventual transformation into a liberal humanist. And Betacek, by the way, um, his friends tried for years to get him to write a book. And finally, at age 69, he published his first book, Adventures with the Texas Naturalist, which some critics feel is the best book of all published uh, from the Holy Trinity of Dobie, Betacek, and Webb. It's certainly a very fine book. Oh, on this slide, you can boo and hiss if you like. <laughs> Dobie had opponents, believe it or not. Anybody know who this guy on the left is? That's Papio O'Daniel. Not from the Coen Brothers film, but the real Papio O'Daniel. And as governor, he appointed very conservative regents uh, to run UT Austin, who uh, clamped down on freedom of speech, academic freedom, all of those things. Fired the president who was defending that concept and created this kind of huge mess for UT in the 1940s. And um, he and Dobie had several choice words for each other. In the middle, J. Edgar Hoover, yes. And um, 
one of the things that I found out working on this book is that Hoover ha had the FBI secretly investigate Dobie as a possible communist subversive. Um, and it's interestingly, you know, the FBI got concerned when they saw Dobie um, calling for the complete integration of UT Austin and things like that. They thought he was quite radical. But what really set them off is that when Dobie had a column where he criticized the Gestapo or the FBI's Gestapo tactics, as he called it, and then all the alarm bells went off. You can see it in the files. And then here on the right, that's J. Evitz Haley. And this is one of the, it's kind of a sad story in a way. Um, Haley was really Dobie's closest friend during the 1920s and or, uh, much of the 1930s. And Haley became kind of the most, most vocal conservative in Texas and sort of an early incarnation of what would eventually become the John Birch Society is, is what he was doing. Haley was all for textbook censorship, and by the early 1960s, he created a new organization, Texans for America, that forced the withdrawal of books such as The Grapes of Wrath from school libraries. And he denounced textbook writers who, and here's a quote, play down the Constitution and play up Negro communists. His organization opposed any favorable mention in textbooks of uh, the income tax, Social Security, United Nations, farm subsidies, the Marshall Plan, federal funding for schools, UNESCO, and integration. Uh, Texans for America also demanded that textbooks delete any reference to people whose loyalty to America was in question. And this list of names included uh, people such as Albert Einstein, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, all those noted radicals, Willa Cather, Langston Hughes, Carl Sandburg, and also J. Frank Doby was on their blacklist. So uh, Doby and Haley um, had a rather dramatic showdown at the Texas State Capitol, and that's one of the topics I cover in the book. And the cool thing about Doby is that he stood up to the bullies, and he spoke for many people who had no voice. In 1943, during the middle of World War II, he came to believe that big corporations were taking advantage of the war uh, in order to exploit laborers. And so he wrote this column arguing that workers had the right to strike, even during wartime, and just for some context or perspective, you know, unions were practically Ill illegal in Texas at the time. <laughs> and so what you see here on the left is an example of, well, what happened with this article Dobie wrote is that the pro-union, pro-labor publications across the country picked up the article and reprinted it and handed it out by the tens of thousands to union members. And Dobie, of course, had given away the rights for free to do that and, and sat back very content in the latest media firestorm he had created. Here on the right, you see one of Dobie's articles mentioned in The Emancipator. And as I mentioned, in the 1940s, Dobie was calling for the complete integration of UT Austin. Um, and that was really the final straw for many of the reactionaries, or Neanderthals as they were known. Um, Dobie's newspaper column got canceled. He lost readers by the thousands. He got fired by UT. And he got hundreds if not thousands of pieces of hate mail. And if any of that ever bothered him, he never let it show because he knew he'd done the right thing. And that's what he cared about. And so I think ultimately what I came to like about Dobie so much is that even though he grew up in a time of great prejudice and narrow-mindedness, he had this early devotion to the open range. And that feeling gradually to expanded to become kind of this abiding belief in an open mind. And that journey is kind of inspiration, I think, for a lot of us. For me in particular, you know, if you're uh, guilty of being somewhat of an idiot or a jerk, two things I can claim. There's hope for you, too, uh, just through the example of Dobie sort of willing himself into this profound transformation by uh, refusing to have blinders on about anything. So when considering Dobie's life, I thought about using the title, Not at All a Normal Man, but I realized that Dobie had already provided the subtitle himself with the epitaph he had on his tombstone, which is, I have come to value liberated minds as the supreme good of life on earth. Thanks. And I'll take questions. <laughs>